All right, we're gonna, we're gonna kick things off. It's 11 o'clock. Um, thank you everybody for coming to our sixth webinar. So get ready to reduce, recycle, and compost at school. And today's focus is gonna be on reusables. And just checking the calendar, it's been a year since our NICRA team, schools team started. And just very exciting that we're on our sixth webinar now. Um, so we have Ben Schleifer here today to report out from Center for Environmental Health. And he's also helping us on the slide deck. Ben, if you could advance to the next slide. So something we haven't done in our past webinars is just letting you know who all is on the committee. So this is the list of our um, lovely team. And remember that we're always looking for you know, additional folks to join. So please reach out to us if, if you want to join on to the committee. Um, no high expectations or commitments required. Um, so yeah, just let us know. Uh, and as Jill just reminded us, as far as if the, anything comes up, as far as questions to the presenters or questions for the overall committee community, just please put those in the chat and we'll stay on top of those. Um, next slide, Ben, please. So standard housekeeping, just remembering we are recording. So if you don't want your video um, to be shared, then, you know, um, turn your video off. And then if you can keep yourself muted, and then when we do have the kind of question answer discussion time, you can take yourself off mute if you want to talk. And then we'll have the video um, uploaded onto our website for others to see or folks to refer back to. And then next slide. So today's agenda, right? Reusables. Um, really appreciate that Ben could join us today to talk about his work with Center for Environmental Health. Um, ben is a wealth of knowledge and experience, really appreciating his overall expertise. So Ben used to um, have a position with the school's program team with stop waste for a couple of years. So he gets the whole school waste <laughs> issues, uh, doing waste audits and working with green teams. And then now with him being at Center for Environmental Health and working on food service issues, and he's dropping into the whole world of food service for school districts and getting to know directors. Yeah, so it's really great perspective that Ben has. And with that, I would like to turn it over to you, Ben, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for the lovely intro, Nancy. I was telling Nancy and Ruth that, uh, you know, presenting for Nick was big time for me. So I really appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, really quick, uh, yeah, my name is Ben Schleifer and I am the EDC Endocrine Disrupting Chemical Food Program uh, Coordinator at Center for Environmental Health. Center for Environment is a nonprofit based out of Oakland, and we're dedicated to keeping the public from um, health exposures uh, of toxic chemicals in the lived environment. And uh, the foods team is particularly concerned about food service wear. So yeah, food service wear. Um, to be honest, since probably two, three days ago, I've had five to ten different food service wares come to me and I've eaten off them. Uh, it's just kind of a, a way that it is right now. Um, there's a variety of different types of food service wares. You can find plastic, you can find paper products, you can even still find some polystyrene. And today I'm going to talk about some of the waste impacts, but you all know that pretty good. So I'm also going to bring it the level of uh, health impacts of what this food service wear means. So yeah, um, to start with, let's talk about school meals and food service wear in the school cafeteria. In the US, 5 billion meals are served every year, billion with a B. Um, and you know, that can just, uh, a lot of that, maybe 90% of that is on a uh, disposable food service wear. And just to give an example of impact of just one school, an elementary school with about 450 serve, uh, students can serve um, you know, 80,000 meals a, a year. Um, and if those meals were on foam trays, so polystyr expanded polystyrene trays, um, that would cost $6,000 to buy those trays and then throw them away. Um, the trays weight would be about 2,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of a 2015 Mitsubishi's Mirage. 
Um, I actually priced one out recently and it, those are $8,000. So you could spend 6,000 on something you throw away after 30 minutes, or you could spend $8,000 for a car. Um, but I, uh, polystyrene's by design isn't that heavy. So I like to talk about its volume. If you were to stack all of those 80,000 trays on top of one another, it would be uh, over 400 feet tall. So it's a 40 story building. So it takes up a lot of space. Um, and yeah, that's just from one elementary school with, you know, kind of a median population of 450. Um, and like also the disposables, you get these items uh, and you're giving them to students and you're like, dispose of this properly. So really quick, how would you dispose of this? I have 10 pounds of green bees uh, wrapped in plastic and served in those black paper uh, um, trays. Um, how do you dispose of these? How do you ask a student of? Oh, I, I have to give you context too though, because it depends on where you are. It's not the same at home or at school. So let's say you have mixed recycling. Let's say you have an organics bin and let's say you have a landfill bin, but no food share in the cafeteria. So how would you dispose of this in that situation? And that's just one item. Imagine you have a lot of food items in the cafeteria. And you're asking the students who, again, K through 12, so kinders, as well as middle schoolers, as well as high schoolers to dispose of this stuff and know where everything goes and sort it properly. And remember, they have about 30 minutes for their school and they have this really attractive recess right after their lunch. And, and no one really enforcing or like making sure that they're doing it properly. They usually wanna do it properly, but they have no one to ask. And so, this is kind of uh, an example of what we're asking students to do around disposable foodware. But again, you all know all that because, you know, it's NICRA. NICRA is aware of the waste problems at school. I want to give you something else to be aware of, another lens and another way to think about the, um, the food service wear that you find at school. And the lens is that of chemicals. Uh, what, we, we all know that polystyrene's bad, but um, why is it bad? What's inside there? And what about molded fiber, the replacement for polystyrene? Is that stuff good? And what about our favorite plastic? I give you a black plastic tray. What are the chemicals in there? I mean, if, if you shouldn't have to have a PhD in chemistry to know some of these things. And we're kind of asking people to be aware of it. So let's take the first one, Pol expanded polystyrene, also known as styrofoam. You might have seen it. Trays of this or cups. I usually see cups. They're dirt cheap. It's almost free. The stuff that uh, it's come out. It's it, one of its features is it's super lightweight and it can be mass produced in a variety of shapes. But as you all know, there's lots of problems with it on the waste end, but there's also problems with it on the health end. Styrene, part of the poly and polystyrene, is um, a human carcinogen. It's anticipated to be a human carcinogen because they can't do. Um, human studies because we're too exposed to it already. I mean, if you don't know what a carcinogen is, it's some, a chemical that is reasonably believed to cause cancer. And so styrene in the polystyrene probably causes cancer. Um, and like in schools, I've heard folks trying to promote, uh, rather than getting rid of expanded polystyrenes, um, recycling polystyrene via the styrogenie, which takes all this polystyrene, you can see on, on one side of my slide, and then melts it down. So these again are, car are carcinogenic chemicals, and they're gonna add heat, melt it down. So adding heat all into the air, into this nice lovely sludge that is arguably recycled. Which honestly, it's not. Uh, this is like one of the solutions to the, the plastic pollution problem coming out of polystyrene. I would say if anyone tries to promote a styrogeny on a school K through 12 campus, that is a big flag. Like there's a lot of chemicals going around and these chemicals are, you know, super impactful for the youth. So like, this is not really a solution. Moving away from polystyrene is good. A lot of uh, schools I've seen form plastic. So crystallized polyethylene tetra. Again, need a PhD in chemistry to know all this, these polymers, but it is microwavable plastic, CPET for short, can stand high heats, it's cheap, can be mass produced, and you can put that little ceiling line on it. Well, it's 
by plastic scorecards, it's deemed medium safe. So, you know, orange. Um, it only contains methanol, zelenes, zine, p-zeline, and ethylene glycolate in the manufacturing. Those are the chemicals of concern. Uh, why are they of concern? You no, know, they could affect human health. It's hard to do studies on these. But um, again, these are. this is one of the safer plastics. We, uh, I would prefer something I could be more sure about, but that's just me. But there's really big problems with plastics in general if you're looking at the waste and the environmental health way. It's made from fossil fuels, so it's a non-sustainable resource. We're running out of fossil fuels. The fossil fuel companies are pivoting to plastics as the, a way to stay alive. But honestly, we need to figure out how to move away from plastics in general because we just can't do anymore. Um, the recyclability of plastic is, you can hear all sorts of fun numbers around it. Um, the one that CEH is promoting is about 9% of plastics are actually getting recycled. Um, but again, different numbers, the markets change. Why would you want to deal with something that is this, um, uh, not flexible, why, why would you want to deal with something that the markets can change and suddenly something can't be recyclable? To me, it's like, I, I just don't want to do that. Uh, microwave heating and leaching. So a lot of these food products get into a microwave. And when you excite the water molecules inside these plastic products, the oligomers, which are the, the building blocks of the plastic project, can leach into food. We have studies that show this. Um, and again, it's just like how these are being used is not really matching up with uh, um, uh, the, the, what the, the producers think that they're doing. With it. So again, these things are getting microwaved and they shouldn't be, and that can affect food. Um, and also the microplastic and uh, the new one is nanoplastic problem. So it's easy to see the microplastics because they're visible and you can capture them in the ocean. But if you look at the body, we're also putting in lots of nanoplastics. They did studies uh, with uh, pregnant women's placentas and we're seeing lots and lots of nanoplastics within them. And like, again, we're not 100% sure what those health effects are, but we shouldn't be having to deal with it or figuring out what those health effects are. There's principle of this foreign entity in my body doing something weird that's man-made and frankly we don't need. But yeah, what I really want to talk to you all about is the molded fiber products. So um, grease-resistant clamshell made from molded fiber. Let's say it's sugar bagasse, but all the molded fibers are kind of similar. Um, it's made from plant-based materials. It is sort of water-resistant and can be mass-produced and made those molds. And it's not this weird stuff that's a hot mess. Well, the problem is there is something wrong with it. So I'm gonna drop a little chemistry on you fast, which are per and polyfluorinated alkaline substances. It is where you bond a carbon to a fluorine and it's a really, really strong chemical bond. What it means when I say real strong chemical bond is there's no real great way to break it down in nature or in biological systems and environmental systems. And so they've dubbed it the forever chemical. And this stuff is found in a lot of variety of different products out there. The first one is PFOA, which is also known as Teflon, and it was used to coat like cookware, so it was non-stick. Well, I mean, the, the company that was making it, a lot of the people in the community around it were getting to all sorts of weird cancers and birth defects, and so it became clear that this is not a great chemical. A new study has come out that if you cook with Teflon and you have a pet bird nearby, it will kill the bird. It is a chemical that you don't necessarily want touching your food, but it's just one of the PFAS chemicals. There's over 9,000 of these PFAS chemicals and the chemistry uh, department, uh, the, the chemical companies will just say, yeah, PFO is not bad, but if we remove one of these fluorine chains, then it it's, it's fine, it won't mess with biological processes in the similar way. And they're like, who says who? Um, and it's uh, kind of problematic to think that, you know, this class of chemical that doesn't break down in the environment is out there. It's been shown to be in 98% of the US's blood. It's in the water we drink. Um, it's um, being banned by states. California and Maine just have recently banned some of this chemical. Um, what else is bad about it? Um, it can get into the compost. So if you take a 
product with PFAS in it and it's in the molded fiber. So they, it's not just a coating they put on top of these things, but they actually, when they pulping this up, they inject the chemical into it. So it's in the product. Um, when you compost it or send it to an organics facility, chops it up, but the, the PFAS, again, forever chemicals are in the compost and it can then be uptaked by whatever plant is growing in the compost. So it's a big problem. Here are some of the products that you can find it in. Um, you can hear about it in rainware. REI has just is trying to outlaw some of it in their products. Again, cookware is the classic one. Firefighting foam, uh, it's again water resistant, so uh, it can help with fires, but folks around firefighting like testing sites have been testing with really high levels of PFAS and that's not good. And if you take home one message from uh, my talk today, stop eating popcorn from the popcorn bag because the chemicals is actually on the inside of the paper lining. So it's just not great to be ingesting this stuff. Um, and yeah, we're trying to turn half as it were. So here is a moment that you can interact which of these trays do you think have PFAS in them? So blow up the chat. You can say the middle top or the bottom left. Which ones do you think have PFAS in them? Just by looking at it. Two more. And then I can move on. Oh, I got two answers. Here are some of the PFAS that we have found in these products. So um, I'm going to talk about parts per million PPM. And so if you're getting to a thousand parts per million, that's every part uh, uh, for every thousand parts of the tray, so the sugar bagasse, you have one part PFAS. And check it out. We have a world-centric five compartment tray that has 773 parts per million PFAS. We have an Eco Products that has 680 parts per million PFAS. We have a Chinette or Hudamaki. Uh, and again, I don't know what product number this was. A school sent it to me and I saw that it says China on one of the compartments, but I honestly don't know which product this is other than it's from China. And we tested that and that had 487 parts per million, which again, how many parts per million of safe with PFAS? I usually say zero because it's a man-made chemical and we don't need to be putting it in there, but we'll talk about the numbers a little bit later on. But the thing I wanted to point out is this was about two years ago we tested these and the, each of these companies have made some sort of shift around PFAS because the people are getting more educated, but world centric, we have a tray down here that has 17 parts per million, which we'd probably deem as safer than 700 parts per million. For eco products, CEH just teamed up with them on the green screen label here and they have a line, the Vanguard line, that has no intentionally added PFAS. And moreover, we made sure that they're not using regrettable substitutions, like a, a chemical that could be bad, but hasn't really been tested uh, for health effects, but we know it's grease resistant, so we put it in there. We, uh, we, we have started certifying stuff green screen, which means it's none of those chemicals that we haven't tested that could be bad or in there. Um, and so Eco Products has been you know, it has put out a tray that would we would deem not safe, but now they're working with us to put out trays that are deemed safe for just one line of their product, though. Um, and again, we, we tried a, a, a China Hudamaki Save Day, and it was right at the edge of uh, the parts per million at 114 billion. So again, the companies are kind of shifting, but there's no way to tell which item has PFAS. Um, a lot of these trays don't even have the company logo on it. So like you can get this tray, for example, which I happen to know is a China Save Day has zero indication that that is indeed the case. And so when you're talking about composting, this becomes all sorts of problematic because BPI will no longer certify products with PFAS in them as of 2020. And also CMA will no longer certify products with PFAS in it. 
but how is someone at the compost facility supposed to differentiate between one product that may have PFAS and one product that might not have PFAS? Are we asking them to read this is world centric and then look up on the world centric database is uh, that this doesn't have PFAS? So you'll see some composting facilities that are no longer taking food service ware because of this issue. And that's a big deal because one of the main points of having this molded fiber product is that it's compostable, but the compost uh, facilities can't take it because they're not sure if there's PFAS in it. That becomes a really big problem. Oh, and in case you didn't have enough to worry about, let me add a little bit more. Um, PFAS have been shown back, uh, vaccine efficacy. Um, and also people who are more exposed to PFAS seem to have a more severe uh, reaction to COVID-19. Again, correlation studies, not causation, but this is strong evidence that PFAS are doing something with our immune system. And since they are an endocrine disrupting chemical, that kind of tracks because um, it's messing with our autoimmune responses. So let me just put up some of the, the health impacts of these disposables, and I bet you know where I'll be getting to next, but there is a lot. Man, I just bummed you all out. I know it. I can just see it in Nancy's face that suddenly, man, I have all this information. What am I going to do about it? Um, this is another problem, another crisis that we have to deal with, and there's plenty on the plate. So um, now what do we do? I'm going to provide some solutions, and then the big solution, I think, is kind of at the end. But um, see, if you're curious about your molded fiber product, CEH will be happy to test your product. And we actually have a database, and here's the URL below this slide. Um, if you type in CEH public database foodware into your Googles, it will also pop this up. And this clearly labels low or no fluorine, which is an indicator for PFAS. So if it's in green, we say it's good. If it's uh, in red, we say try to avoid that one. Our cutoff is 100 parts per million because that's uh, BPI's cutoff. It is a bit of an arbitrary number. Um, there's not, if you have 100 parts per million, that is not necessarily safer than a 101 parts per million. Again, I want to turn off the tap and get down to zero, but um, it's kind of, it's nice to have a, a, a number cut off just to give us a, a baseline of where we're shooting for. And this is a public database, so it's free and online. And if you want something to be tested and it's not on here, then uh, CH would be happy to test it for PFAS takes about three weeks and we cover the cost of testing. But if you're going to uh, hit me up for testing, and I encourage everyone to do it, uh, I need uh, SQU numbers or the number of the product. And that's just to make sure we haven't tested it before. I, getting those plates that say ChiNet on it and then testing for PFAS and then finding PFAS doesn't really help anyone move the conversation along except for that one person we tested for. We want to create a more open public dialogue so folks can know, oh, I need to avoid that trade. We also, like I mentioned, have a green screen certification that came out earlier this month, so it's brand new. And my supervisor, Sue, had been working on it for three years in the making. And this is, again, a comprehensive way to look at the chemicals that are in a product from a lot of different ends. And we uh, there's three different levels. There's civil, gold, and platinum. And all of them deal with um, chemicals of concern. And it's, uh, um, it's good to know that if you see this seal on a food service wear product, it is safe via chemicals. Um, and that is a good thing to know. Um, green screen certify will only work with compostable or recyclable products. Um, plastics are going to have a really large, many hurdles to overcome to become green screen certified because we're looking at just thousands of different chemicals of concern. And so it's mostly for uh, uh, molded fiber kind of fiber-based products, but there is green screen certify for a lot. And so if you're man, if you are a purchaser and you have a, a, a relationship with your manufacturer, say, or a distributor, say, I want green screen certified because I know it's safe. And um, if you want more details on that, I'd be happy to talk about why it's safe. And you're seeing this, uh, that uh, the 
as people get more educated around PFAS, that the advertising on Amazon is talking about foodware that is PFAS free, no intentionally added PFAS, proudly PFAS free, no PFOAs or PFAS, do not contain toxins with PFAS chemicals. You're seeing this in the food service where now um, from the marketing end because people are demanding it. Uh, John Oliver did a bit about a month ago on PFAS, which was, if you haven't seen it, Google John Oliver and PFAS and it's worth a view because it talks about it, but it doesn't dive deeply into the foodware, which I think is problematic. And so, um, yeah, people are getting more aware of it. States are banning it. Um, a new bill just passed in California, SB 1200, which bans the food packaging with PFAS in California by 2023. That's great. I'm not exactly sure how many, what, what kind of teeth this, this bill has, but it allows for nonprofits like me to sue a, a manufacturer or a distributor that is selling um, PFAS in the state of California. The problem is that this takes a really long time and it puts a lot of impetus on us to identify if it has PFAS or not. And these claims of PFAS free or no intentionally added PFAS um, can be a bit dubious because uh, if they, make the product and they don't have PFAS uh, in the product, but they've done a PFAS product right before in the manufacturing line, you can have some residuals that can get into the product as well. And so it's, it's kind of um, not ideal. Also, it's a, a, a more than a year out. Um, it's SB 1201 bans labeling any products containing PFAS as compostables, but as you know, with the compostable label, it's a bit problematic because you might be able to call it biodegradable. You might be able to put a little leaf on it and folks are going to be like, well, this looks like a biodegradable product. It has the leaf, so they obviously care about green stuff. So I'm just going to compost it and try. It helps, but again, I think a, a bigger issue is figuring out a way to turn off the tap. Um, the EPA also recently put out a roadmap to, uh, uh, to address PFAS, but um, this is something that the FDA needs to weigh in on, and the FDA is a very slow to move entity. A lot of people say the F in FDA is silent. Um, and so the, the, this one, it would be a hard push. And even the EPA's roadmap to PFAS is not exactly as strong language as I like, but again, um, living in the field. So something's better than nothing for sure. But honestly, again, I don't want to get a PhD in chemistry to know if this is the right food service where to buy. And like, I don't feel like I should know the state bills and figure out if it, is it 2023 that they're implementing and where are the teeth? Like if I'm going to be putting work to find healthier food service where there's just an easier, simpler solution for me. And as you might imagine, it is the reusable solution. So why are we shipping all these products often from overseas in China to a school every year or couple years? And they use this product for maybe 30 minutes and then throw it away, which then increased waste hauling. And you have to buy this product, even if it's a penny a pop, you still have to buy it over and over and over again. I know when I was growing up, this was not the way of it. Like the, we moved to disposables in the eighties around schools. While folks on the West Coast were worried about drought. So dish machines became a problematic, but this to me is normal. The, the kids eating off a reusable tray, that's normal. That's how they might do at home. They don't throw away their, their, their plates every day at home. This to me is just a more natural and a better solution to dealing with this constant amount of weight. Um, first and foremost, reusables are COVID safe. Like there's a lot of like concern about surface area contacts. Uh, in April, the CDC put out surface areas is not the way COVID gets transmitted. It is your water droplets in the A, air rather. Um, what else? Ooh, sorry, not ready for that. They're made of safe materials. You can get uh, stainless steel, uh, which is way safer, but you can also get uh, safer plastics if you'd like. Again, if you're gonna be buying this once, I kind of want to get the nicer things, but that's just me. And uh, CH will be working with uh, Clean Production Action to figure out a green screen for reusables. That was the ultimate goal. 
start with the disposables, then we're going to move to reusables. But if you're worried about your material or you're thinking about buying reusable, CH wants to work with you and figure out um, what is the base, best and safest. Because some of the plastics aren't great. Polycarbonate is a plastic that might not be the best for putting food on. Um, you all know it has a better life cycle uh, impact, something you use hundreds of times versus once. It just kind of makes sense that it's going to have a better life cycle impact. And this also can prevent climate chaos because you're not shipping all this products. Um, PFAS, uh, one of the PFAS chemical uh, biochemicals when they're producing it, is uh, one of the most potent greenhouse gas polluters. It's 17 thousand times more potent than CO2. And methane is only at like a hundred times more potent than CO2. The, the, the PFAS include a super polluting chemical and there's a loophole so they can still produce it. Uh, a, it's a, a chemical plant in Louisville pollutes more than the all the cars in Louisville driving over a year. It's just a super polluter. Um, it can save money. It just kind of makes sense that something you don't have to buy over and over again can save money, but there has to be some sort of systematic revamping. So dish machines are something you have to consider and who are gonna wash these dishes is something you have to consider. Um, but if you just look at the, we'll talk money in just a second. The one I really wanna talk to you about is that this just teaches good values. We see disposables, again, like I said, I've used like more than 10 in the last 48 hours. Um, and it's because it's been normalized. It's because we are teaching students that throwing something away at the institutional level is okay. And it really isn't. We shouldn't be having a design where something has to get thrown away every single day and that the, teacher, the, the students have to figure out how to sort properly. It should be like, this is a valuable resource and we should figure out what we can do to save it as best as possible. And so I think reusables is just a better value judgment. And that, again, will help the students be more prepared and resilient for uh, any climate troubles that might be coming down the pipeline. This is an opinion. I have not got the study on this one, but I also just think you can prevent food waste by serving stuff on reusables. It just makes the food look better. I know there's a study out there and I will find it eventually, but um, I just think if you want to reduce food waste first, make sure that your recess is before lunch because that's just a really easy thing to do. And if you serve the food on reusables, I think you'll also be preventing food waste because the food looks more attractive as these kids from Austin Unified look very happy. We didn't pose them at all. This was all natural. Okay. Needless to say, I'm also very biased to the reusable solution. I'm so biased that we made a toolkit to help flip cafeterias. This outlines a lot of the health impacts of not only molded fiber, but plastics. But uh, we also worked extensively to get a 12-step way to transform your cafeteria. And again, as Nancy said, I, I have a lot of experience doing this via stop waste, but um, it's a, a process that you can kind of jump on at any point. So if you're having a school assembly to celebrate whatever, it's a, and you want to announce you're trying to move to reusables, that's a good time to start. But these are the action outline plans that I see as being necessary to kind of flipping a school. Um, you want to outline your motivations. You want to get partners. This is very lonely work. So you want to make sure you have as many partners to help you along the way and make it sustainable. Um, you you got to figure out how to assess. So usually doing a waste audit. You got to figure out how to what program you want. Do you want to just get rid of the support kits, or do you want to get all reusables immediately as soon as possible, and and just instead of doing stepping stones, just jump right in. You got to set up a schedule to monitor because there is going to be learning hiccups when you change any system like the school cafeteria. You also have to enlist your stakeholders, and it's really important that you have a diverse group of stakeholders. School systems turn over a lot, not just the students, but the teachers and the staff and the custodians too. So if you have different partners and stakeholders who are bought in, it really helps. Um, we can talk, we'll, we'll talk purchasing dishwashing a little bit, having a launch assembly is really important um, and training and monitoring to make sure that it, the system, it can be sustained and is good and is working as, as it was intended to function. Um, you always want to evaluate how you did and how you could do better, but uh, one of the key steps I often miss is to celebrate. You also have to celebrate these wins and use it kind of as another way to push even further. So let's talk about some of the barriers to moving to reusables. Uh, usually some folks will 
push back on costs. Stainless steels trays can be upwards of 10, 15 bucks. Um, and uh, styrofoam's a penny. But again, if you're looking at it over multiple years, eventually something that you don't have to buy will pay back for it. We provide uh, some food calculators, but even at the stainless steel level, we tested some of the cheaper stainless steel at the bottom of the slide, the $2.59. We found that it has no lead, so we're considering it fairly safe. And um, if we bought 1,500 for that 500 person elementary school, instead of the 81,000 trays we would buy in the year, it pays for itself in about six months, um, which is really cool. But that's just the food service wear. And if you need these calculators, it's on that, uh, the toolkit that CEH developed. Um, but we also have a, a, a generous nonprofit called Plastic Free Restaurants that is helping schools transition away from uh, plastic disposables. John, are you on the line somewhere? And he had to pop off and he's going to try and come back on in about 15 minutes. So I'll keep an eye out for him. But. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a last minute thing. So I just wanted to see oh, hey, the opportunity to say, I will make sure we're considering. But anyways, this nonprofit is will pay the difference between the disposable plastic a tray and uh, so like a styrofoam tray and the stainless steel. So let's say the styrofoam tray cost a dime, the stainless steel costs $10, he will pay the $9.90 difference between those two to buy reusables for an entire school. It is not just restaurants, he is looking to pivot towards schools. And I'll give him an opportunity to say a little bit more about it and there will be time for questions, but that's one of the big cost barriers kind of knocked off. Another barrier is that dish machine. Dish machines, um, some schools have them, but a lot do not, or a lot have been pulled out. Um, there was a case study down in Glendale, Franklin Elementary, where the PTA just got on board and just was like, we're gonna get a dish machine because there's too much waste. It was really cool because the, the, the principal got really into the project and has made YouTube videos to explaining why they're reusables and why there's a really cool dish machine. Is Monica on the line somewhere? If not, that is okie dokie. But um, yes, Glendale is interested in sharing out how their success worked and how they picked the trays they picked and how they got the dish machine and they worked with Hobart extensively to pick out a dish machine and figure out the renovation. And again, uh, if you're looking at their 650 students and we're just saying half of them use uh, uh, eat at school every day, that's a uh, over 150,000 disposables prevented from going to the landfill every year. And um, again, getting the PTA on board for this is a really fun PTA project. It's an environmental one. And um, you can get uh, other flips into the cafeteria. Like they did the whole things, including composting and food share in one go while rolling out these reusables. And now the students are eating off of reusables, which is kind of cool. So again, there's a little question uh, during times of COVID, uh, the, these systems, if they're not robust, can change. So I, I haven't double checked. I think they're moving back to the reusables after COVID, but it's hard because a lot of the students are not eating in the cafeteria anymore. And as it gets safer and safer, we expect them to move back in. Another bar barrier is stakeholder engagement. I try to flip this get the stakeholders involved as soon as possible. Um, we did a, we were working on a case study to get Berkeley Unified School District to pilot reusables, these pretty stainless steel items. And um, we were getting pushback, but we were kept reaching out and nudging Bonnie, the nutrition service director, who's been amazing to work with. And now she's kind of taking the reins. Uh, and so deciding which products work, will work the best and why, helping us pick which schools are more ripe to, to, to pilot this in, helping us design if we're gonna be using a central kitchen versus a decentral kitchen. And we're actually gonna be using a central kitchen because middle, uh, 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 King Middle School actually has a dish machine that has capacity to wash a lot of dishes. And without Bonnie, we wouldn't have known that a couple of the elementary schools at BUSD just have zero place to put a dish machine. And so um, 
enlisting her, enlisting custodians, enlisting principals, enlisting uh, facilities managers, someone on that level is really important and getting them to feel like they're a champion. We've had Bonnie present with Berkeley uh, Unified School District students on multiple webinars, and she's going to be doing another one for us. She's really bought in because we, uh, and we're really uplifting all the work she's doing around this. And so that's the kind of way to, uh, I believe, to help engage the stakeholders. If someone's resistant, find someone who is not, who is in a similar role and see what you can do. Also bringing in the student voice is really, really important. The stakeholders are supposed to serve the students. And when the students can say with authenticity and with like data backing them up that you aren't serving me, you're actually, you know, messing with my fertility. It's really powerful and it's really hard to ignore. Uh, another barrier is labor. Um, the labor piece is, uh, again, hard to overcome because there's a lot of union workers. But another case study, and this is in Austin Independent School District with 75,000 plus students, kind of reframed it. They, they said that we, instead of paying for something that you throw away after 30 minutes, we think it's important to pay someone for an important and meaningful job. So they're using the money that they're saving from not buying disposables every single year to pay their labor workers. And again, it's not an easy thing to get done, but once you start, usually uh, the nutrition staff who are sometimes the, the lowest paid in the school community or would jump at some more hours to do it. Um, getting the unions involved, getting the nutrition folks to be like, yeah, I would much rather touch this reusable than this toxic disposable every single day. Enlisting those folks to kind of come to the table and say, yeah, we're gonna try to change up the labor, but we want it to be better for you. And be part of that conversation is important. Um, but also the, 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 the executive chef at Austin, her, her main advice to anyone who's thinking about reusables is start small. Start with a little win, start with those sport kits and instead of giving it to the students every single day, have them like take it as needed or a straw dispenser or a napkin dispenser. When you start with those little pieces, you can actually move up and um, you know, the, the, the health end of just getting rid of the sport kits is important. They, uh, there's a lot of plastic in them. They're very low quality plastic and it's like not something we should be exposing the students to, the youths to every single day. So there's um, uh, an edge of health to it. But again, if you're looking at molded fiber trays, this is, uh, and you're between reusables and molded fiber, this is a good, using the health lens is a good way to really get over the finish line to bed. Like we really should be doing the work for reusables. Okay. I know I talk a lot. I know I talk pretty fast. And uh, so I wanted to open it up to Q&A. Um, I also have my contact here as well as my cell. I want to engage with as many folks in California and across the, the country, honestly, as possible. Um, my job is to get reusables into schools and I can provide a lot of um, interesting data that would, might convince uh, some stakeholders. But I'm gonna toss it over to Nancy who might be helping with the Q&A. And is it okay if I stop sharing? Sure, let's see some faces. Um, so Ben, we have the first question is from Olivia. And her question is, how is it legal to produce food containers that could kill us? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, there, again, there should be some regulatory uh, agencies that are looking at this at the national level. Um, and they, for a variety of reasons, are not. So um, EPA, FDA are the ones that come to the forefront. And um, there's some rules on the books in the FDA that are over half a century old. And that you know, sets the precedence that if they think a chemical is safe one time, they don't have to go back and revisit it as we get more data. So um, it's a partly a bureaucracy thing. It's partly lack of public demand. People don't, uh, when you're looking at the PFOAs on the, uh, so the Teflon on the nonstick pan, they don't know that their endocrine chemicals are getting disrupted until 10 years after exposure while they really enjoy the non-stickingness of the pan in the immediate. So it's kind of that kind of conversation. So yeah, I feel you, Olivia, I, I, I empathize, like my job shouldn't have to exist, but right now is not, that is not the state of things. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, asking, uh, getting involved with the state 
initiatives to get rid of PFAS and even the national initiatives to have a better look at the chemicals is a way to work around it, but that's you know not an easy fix right now. Thank you, Ben. Jeff Rivero has a great question. He, when you showed all of the different articles that were had different uh, parts per million, you showed world centric with 17 parts per million. He asks, does that item have any other negative chemicals? Um, again, when when CH does testing, we're looking for total fluorine, and the flu total fluorine is the indicator of PFAS. So we're really looking at molded fiber for PFAS. Um, different products diff have different chemistry and then different chemicals of concern. So it's hard to know uh, if there's something other in there and the manufacturers don't have to tell us. We do have in California Prop 65, which they do have to disclose if we ask them in the right way, uh, certain things that might be bad for health, but we also have to figure out, um, are those chemicals bad for health? So. PFAS, 9,000 chemicals. We know PFOA, Teflon, is a bad chemical, but the, the, the agency, the manufacturer of the product can be like this other PFAS. This, you all have to do studies to show it's bad for your health uh, rather than taking a precautionary principle. So it's hard to say for sure. I do want to uplift that just because there's one world-centric product that tested low doesn't mean other products, different lines, different brands are uh, safe across the board. We're seeing the, the manufacturers move that way um, consistently, and that's the point. We want them to turn off the tap, but um, just because you have a world-centric does not mean it's safe. We would recommend that you check out the public database. We have school-related food service wear, but also just all the food service wear as well. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Becky has a question. She says, I thought Hudamaki was uh, BPI certified, meaning they are now PFAS-free. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you, <laughs> the, it changes and it's uh, Hudamaki, Chinet puts out a lot of products and some of their products might not have changed in 20, 30, 40 years. It might've had products that are still coming out on the line that was before PFAF. So it's hard to make a blatant statement about the manufacturer product. I'm sorry, yeah, I have to clarify the trays, the trays that you were showing, I thought they were now PFAS free, the two yeah. trays, Chinet. Yeah, yeah, the, the save a day trays have been testing low PFAS, which is great. We want them to do that. But um, to me, it's also like, it's uh, uh, how do we know they're not going to change their product? Because um, uh, change their product line. How do we, uh, it's like they have to pay a hoard of money to BPI to get it to say it's certified compostable. Um, it takes time to test the, the certification of that. And it's also, uh, um, you know, it, it, one product might not be the same as the other product. So you have a five compartment tray that's save a day from China, and then you have another compartment tray that says China and you're not sure and you don't know the SKU number and like, why should the purchaser need to know the SKU number? Those kind of questions bubble up for me. So yes, I would, I do want to direct folks to safer disposables, but to me, the easier solution than worrying about any of that is just get a reusable that you know is safe and then you can just use over and over again. Hey, Ben, we have yeah. John Myers from Plastic Free Restaurant back on. So I know there's a few questions about his, his offerings. Do we want to um, switch gears slightly? Absolutely. I, John, do you want to tell tell these purchasers your your pitch around schools and plastic free restaurants? Sure, yes, and I'm sorry for the snafu on getting on the call. I apologize. Um, yeah, so plasticfreerestaurants.org is a 501c3 nonprofit. We found we started about a year ago. We exist entirely to eliminate single use petroleum based plastic from restaurants, schools, and anyone else who serves food and drink using single use petroleum based plastic by subsidizing the cost difference between the single use plastic you use and the reusables that you replace it with. Nine times out of 10, that ends up being like a 95% subsidy. We literally compare a single single use product to a single reusable product. So a two cent fork against a 70 cent stainless steel fork will cover 68 cents of the cost. Uh, in the case of nonprofits and schools that are publicly funded, we'll actually cover 100% of the cost. It's not actually a price difference thing. Um, 
there are no applications, there are no forms to fill out. All we ask for is a method to verify what it is that you're telling us. Usually the easiest way to do that is by looking at invoices. So we ask you to send us invoices from the past couple of months of plastic usage that you, you know, single use plastic that you're using so that we can verify the SKU numbers, take a look at the numbers that you're, the, the, the quantities that you're actually going through. And then we ask for invoices for the reusable products that you are using instead. And we, uh, we crunch the numbers, we do the math, we send you a check in the mail. That's literally all there is to it. Um, you do not have to replace 100% of your single use plastic. We prefer that. And we are curating a list, a nationwide list of restaurants that are 100% plastic free uh, front of house. So where that's possible, uh, that's great, but it is not a requirement. Same goes with schools. Um, and in both cases, we offer a one year anniversary and two year anniversary restocking subsidy. So provided that you are continuing to use the reusable products that we helped you purchase in the first place, one year after we purchased them for you and two years after we purchased them for you, you can get a small bump to buy replacements for things that are lost or stolen or what have you um, damaged. Uh, for restaurants, that is a yeah, that is 10% of the original subsidy unless you compost your food scraps, in which case it is up to 20%. For schools, it is a 20% anniversary subsidy, unless you compost your food scraps, in which case it is up to a 30% subsidy. Um, yeah, there's my email address, contact at plasticfreerestaurants.org. Happy to field any questions anytime. Um, again, you qualify if you serve food and drink and currently use single-use plastic. That's it. Um, the only no. caveats to that are, A, we do not subsidize at present switches from compostable products to reusable products. I realize that sometimes feels as though we're punishing people who were trying to get ahead of the curve and do the right thing. But we've also found that in many cases, even if you're using some compostable products, you're probably still using some petroleum-based plastic. So if that's the case, we're happy to help with those things. And the only other caveat is that we do not subsidize items for which your government or municipality or state local you know authority has already outlawed a certain product so if styrofoam is no longer permitted in your town then you can't hit us up for subsidy money to switch from styrofoam to reusables it has to be a choice on your part um, not a mandate and i occasionally get the question well what if the government outlawed styrofoam last week and it doesn't go into effect for another year okay, if they did it last week and it doesn't go into effect for another year, you're making a choice. You're making a choice to get out of the curve and do it now. We'll help you subsidize it. If they passed the law a year ago and it goes into effect next week, yeah, no, sorry. You waited until the 11th hour and that's not our problem. So we're looking for people that are making an active choice and we cover the cost of the reusables. And we have partnered with non, uh, the other nonprofit, another nonprofit, um, Rethink Disposable, that's been doing a slightly different version of this for about 10 years. They have more paid staff, they have more boots on the ground, they have more experience doing this, and they put out amazing case studies that demonstrate time and time and time again that restaurants save money in the long term by making the switch to reusables, uh, even after factoring in increased costs for um, labor, for water and electricity usage, even in some cases for infrastructure upgrades and dishwasher purchases and that kind of thing. I'll shut up now. Ben, if you've got anything specific you want me to address or anybody else, if you've got any questions, I'm, I'm happy to field those, but I'll stop talking now. Thanks, John. Yeah, really thanks cool service. And we appreciate you offering it up to the crew. Um, uh, are there any more questions in the chat that we want to address or that maybe yeah. uh, could be more directed at John too? Um, there's some questions in the chat. Um, if there are any questions for John, go ahead, put those in the chat, everybody. We'll get to those. Um, but Jeff Rivero asked, what about the plastics that line milk cartons at school? What chemicals are in that lining? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the, there is a little plastic lining on your milk carton situation and it's become a, a waste conundrum as stop waste puts it of where do we put this in the landfill the compost or the recycling bin um it depends who you ask and it depends uh what the intentions are it's not great paper that we can get out of the cartons at milk and it's um i i don't remember it might be pla which is usually a safer plastic but i don't know off the top of my head 
what the plastic of concern is there in, but I can look into it and then get back to you, Jeff. Sorry to give you the workaround answer, but. Thanks, Ben. Hey, that's the best we can ask for. You know what? We'll get back to you and we'll let you know. Rebecca has a question. She said, I was on a call with uh, when Ben was speaking about the plastic free, we pay you to stop using plastic forks. Uh, would you expand on that program? Was that John's program? Yep. Okay. Can I toss you to John? All right, John, tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I was just describing. That's exactly it. We pay you to stop using plastic. If you're currently using single-use plastic, petroleum-based plastic, and you were able and willing to switch to reusables, even if it's a partial switch, we will subsidize that switch. We will help you pay for those items, for stainless steel sporks, for stainless steel containers, for stainless steel trays and plays, uh, plates. Uh, we also subsidize glass, bamboo, wood, uh, our subsidy is 100% of the price difference up to $5 per item for any material that is not, that does not contain virgin plastic. So that even includes 100% reclaimed plastic. If you find a supplier or a manufacturer that is making reusable items out of 100% reclaimed plastic, to my knowledge, there are only two companies out there doing that that sell in the U.S., um, but if you find one of them or go with one of them, we will we will subsidize 100% of that if you feel as though you need to go with plastic for your re reusables. If you absolutely need to use virgin plastic, then our subsidy offer is 50% of the price difference up to $1 per item. So there is still money available. It's just not as much because we're trying to dissuade that. That's I just awesome. want to uplift, like moving from sport kits, which are about a penny to a, 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 a metal reusable spork, which can be a dollar. I'm hearing that John will pay that dollar difference for the entirety of your school population. Um, and that's it. You don't have to do any switch. You, you don't really need a dish machine to wash that many forks. You can throw it into a three sink system and have the nutrition service staff clean them and then reserve them for the next round. That would be an easy switch that we are willing to pay school, and I say we, but John's willing to pay schools for. Um, and it's getting your foot in the door to start that conversation with the nutrition service staff so you can actually push for a little bit more and a little bit more. Let me, let me put a little bit of the impact of that into your heads too. We just paid for 1,200 sporks uh, for a, a school district up in Northern California. And they currently serve about 440 school lunches per day at three different schools. Uh, they need the 1,200 because you need to be able to rotate and clean some while others are being used. And that's part of our vetting process is sort of determining that that's how many you'll actually need and you'll actually use. But 1,200 stainless steel sporks replaced 440 fork and spoon kits per day for 180 school days a year times 440 student lunches works out to about 160,000 pieces of plastic that we eliminated from the waste stream with an investment on our part of about $1,400. So for $1,400, we can help you eliminate 160,000 pieces of plastic every year. And we will do a, an anniversary subsidy of, like I said, 20 to 30% based on, you know, the fact that you're still using the reusables a year from now, two years from now, uh, and that impact multiplies once again. If you're still using those reusables and we help you get a full stock back up to 1,200 sporks that you need, that impact of 160,000 happens every year. It's every year that you're not using 160,000 pieces of plastic shaped into forks and spoons. It's a huge footprint very quickly. The easy, quick win, the students get it. And it's something that you can use as a selling point to make your school greener. Um, I'm seeing we're getting close to time. Do we have time for a, one or two more questions, Jill? You know, I think we got to every question except one, and that was, uh, do we know what happens uh, when plants uptake PFAS that gets into the soil? Like if we send our PFAS to a composting facility that gets turned into compost that's going to farmland, what then do we know? Yeah, it's been pretty uh, clear that it migrates into the farmland food and then it can get into the cow as well that we end up eating again. Diet seems to be the main way that PFAS are getting into our bodies. Um, some of the compost, uh, we've looked at two different types of compost and it seems like the stuff coming from the wastewater treatment plant has a little bit more PFAS in it and that kind of makes sense because we're expelling the, some of those chemicals when we, we, we do waste, but it's also in the water too. Um, 
And so it's in the biosolids, but it also can get into the compost from the organic compost facility. We don't want it in the compost that is growing our food to eat or just making our nature more beautiful. It's just not great. But again, it's really, really hard to get this out of the environment once it's in there. And that's why CEH is really focused on trying to cut off the tap, so to speak. So instead of them pushing more and more in there, we can figure out how to remediate. And by hard, I think Ben means pretty much impossible. Yep, that's why they call them forever chemicals, right? Yep. That's that's the moniker. Well, that's all the questions we have. I'll turn it back over to our program lead. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you for having me again. I'm sorry I was late. No worry, you popped in just in time. Hey, Ben, can you do us a favor? Can you go back to screen sharing so we can do our last two closeout slides? Absolutely. Thank you. Wow. We may need to have you back, Ben and John. That was a lot of information. I see the value maybe in a couple months just with the different information. Um, ah, I'm seeing that you have a different version than the updated version. Um, right. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, no, if you want to go back to the to the announcements, okay. So Green Schools has just released this green print, and it's it's a lengthy document, and I scanned over it some yesterday. It, there's value to there because it's got a lot of kind of framing out. And then we'll have our next webinar on the 13th in January, so save the date. And then the other piece that I was adding in is the link, a little bird told. You muted yourself, Nancy, sorry. Okay. Uh, a little bird told me that Cal Recycle has updated their schools. Um, page on 1383 and then it's going to get officially launched sometime soon but I just put the link in the chat box. Uh, it's got a variety of information in there. I just quickly scanned over it. Uh, and then next slide. Oh and then the idea too is we are asking our Cal Recycle team to um, join us on the call in January so hopefully they can report out on some of the web page details um, and share out with us. Okay, so then please remember that we have our school spreadsheet where we've got a lot of resources. And if you have any resources that we can add to that spreadsheet, we're always looking to expand on that. Consider joining our NICR schools committee. And then we do have our email account that we're keeping tabs on now. Um, so, you know, let's stay in touch and Want to give huge thanks to Ben, very extensive and so much information. And thanks, John, as well, for popping on. And we appreciate everybody joining our call today. Well, looks like someone's Thank already you. calling John to hit him up on that offer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, everybody have a safe holidays and we'll we'll see you in the new year. <laughs>